Hello, and welcome to another episode of Craig Biddle Live. I have a hypothesis that a fair number of uh, liberty-minded uh, people, especially liberty-minded youths, people who want to uh, defend liberty, are uh, claim to be uh, anarchists, but on reflection or on uh, further examination would find that they are not. So I want to talk about a couple of things today that I think will help people who might think that they're anarchists uh, to realize that they're in fact advocates of uh, property limited government, a government limited to the protection of individual rights. Um, so the reason I'm answering this is because I, I frequently hear questions to the effect of, uh, well, aren't all governments, by nature of the fact that they're institutions of force, aren't they all in some way and to some degree uh, rights violating? Uh, in that, for instance, uh, they collect taxation to support what they do and they impose laws on people that, that they force people to, uh, to obey. Um, so the idea is, well, all government is in some way, shape or form uh, a rights violating institution, so shouldn't we just get rid of this thing and there, thereby have freedom? Now, I'm not going to make a whole argument today against anarchism. Um, I've, I've written some materials on that before, and there's a lot of material out there on it. I want to focus on a couple of things that I think uh, many people who embrace that idea are confused about, uh, because I think if we can clarify some of the issues they're confused about, they, they would realize that they're not interested in, in anarchy. They're not interested in trying to establish a society where uh, there are multiple uh, uh, warring factions trying to uh, protect the people who have hired them to protect them all in the same geographical area. So. What I want to do first is I want to focus on exactly what I mean by a rights protecting government. What is this thing? And it has essentially three features that are that are relevant to our conversation today. Uh, the first is that it exists and all of its elements exist for one purpose, to do one thing, and that is to protect the individual rights of citizens by banning the initiation of physical force from social relationships and by using retaliatory force only against those who initiate its use. So, you know, if you live in a society under this kind of government, uh, you're free to produce what you want, to uh, engage in relationships with whomever you want, to trade uh, on whatever terms you and others voluntarily agree to trade on. Uh, and to do all of that kind of stuff without any interference by the government whatsoever, what you're not free to do is punch people in the face, commit fraud, uh, rape, pillage, and plunder. So the government uh, stands as an objective system that says, in effect, to the people, everyone who lives in this geographic area is free to do whatever he or she wants uh, to make his or her life the best it can be. Uh, if you produce values, they're yours to keep. If you commit errors, their their consequences are yours to suffer. The only thing that we, the government, are going to do uh, is step in on the occasions when somebody initiates force or fraud against someone else, because that's illegal. So that's the basic law of the land under a rights-protecting government. The second feature directly flows from that, and that is it is under a rights protecting government, you have objective law, meaning that the law is clearly and uh, openly defined, so everyone knows what the law is, and the law only exists to protect rights. So if there are laws that don't protect rights, the system would work those laws out of the system. They would, they would, those laws would ultimately be repealed by nature of the constitutional setup of that government. The constitution of such a government would set the law of the land as the idea that all laws must uh, serve the same ultimate purpose, which is the protection of rights. And then the third feature of this kind of government that uh, is key to our discussion today is that there would be no forced taxation. There would be no taxation at all. Forced taxation is, is redundant. So how would such a government be funded if, if not by a taxation? 
Um, well, I've written a whole article on this called called How Would uh, Government Be Funded in a Free Society? So if you're interested in a, in a uh, lengthier discussion of that, I, I recommend that you just uh, look for that at theobjectivestandard.com and you can uh, see my deeper thoughts on that. But for our purposes today, um, my view that I express in there is that people in a free society, a society that w in which the culture was ready for a government that only protects rights. I mean, you have to have a culture that wants this kind of government or you're not going to have this kind of government. But if the culture is education uh, is educationally uh, aware of the existence of the possibility of this kind of government, and if the people want this kind of government, they would pay for it voluntarily in the same way and for the same reason that people pay for uh, insurance, uh, whether dental insurance or medical insurance or homeowners insurance or whatever. Pet insurance today people pay for. So the uh, hypothesis in that article and the, the, the uh, principle I argue for there is that people would pony up, especially the people who have the most to lose in a free society, which are the people who have produced the most wealth. They would voluntarily support the government because it's in their best interest to do so. The, the freedom to act on your judgment and to keep the goods that you produce is what makes all of our other values possible. So if, if you're willing to pay for other values, you would certainly be willing to pay uh, some money to establish the possibility of all of those other values. That's the argument in a nutshell there. So the point is that a rights protecting government properly defined is something that can exist in the proper society, in a society that's, that's ready and, uh, and, and sufficiently educated to uh, accept the idea and to work towards such a government. So it's not the case that this is an impossibility. A lot of people say, well, you know, there's never been a rights protecting government in all of history. So there, ergo, it's impossible that we could have one in the future. But that's ridiculous if you think about it. Obviously, there are governments in history that have been more uh, rights protecting than other governments or many governments have been, you know, violated rights in massive and horrific ways, and several governments have substantially upheld rights for a long time, the United States of America being a key example. So obviously there's a range of, uh, of capacity to uh, uphold rights, and if we have the idea that there is such thing as individual rights, and if we can uh, if we understand what it is about the facts of reality and human nature that give rise to the need of that principle and, and of a government that protects individual rights, and we have these ideas now, thank, thanks to Ayn Rand and uh, some others before her, um, if we have those ideas, then we can work toward precisely that. We can work toward a government that does one thing, protects individual rights and does not violate rights, and is supported by voluntary means. So this is a possibility. So given that this is a possibility, if someone says to himself, well, I'm an anarchist because I don't believe in the possibility of such a government, or I don't think that even if it's theoretically possible that it could happen, so I wanna you know, say to hell with government, let's, let's try to go without that thing. Um, my question is this, suppose such a government did exist, just Bear with me on this. So if there is a government that does protect rights, and that's all it does, and you could live in that society, or you do live in that society, let's put it that way, um, and if you're an anarchist, you might say, well, I don't want to be under this government. I don't want to fund it voluntarily. Fine, you don't have to fund it voluntarily. I don't want to obey its laws. Well, there aren't any laws you really have to obey except for the laws that say you may not violate rights. So if you don't want to obey laws that violate your rights by, by you know, stopping you from acting on, on your judgment in a rights, you know, rights uh, respecting manner, you don't have to worry about that either because there are no such laws. There are only laws that say you can't violate rights. So if you say, well, I want to start my own protection agency in this same geographic era, era or area, excuse me, um, why would you want to do that? What is the purpose of your new rights protecting agency in the same geographic area if rights are already being protected here? There's no reason to start a, quote, rights protecting agency in this same area. There's, no, there's nothing to, to protect from. 
uh, and I uh, like to call this the idea of coming to the blessing. You may have heard of the, the uh, common law uh, doctrine of coming to the nuisance, which is the idea that if, uh, if you move to an area where there's some nuisance already in existence, say a pig farmer, uh, so there's a pig farmer and you move and build a house next to him and you come out one day and go, oh my goodness, this place reeks. I don't want to be here. Um, and then you, you take the pig farmer to court and you say, this guy's you know, got pigs next to my new house and, and it, it reeks. Uh, what would happen, at least used to happen, I think this doctrine has, has uh, gone out of favor, unfortunately, because it's a good, good doctrine, but the, the, the courts would say, well, you came to the nuisance, so you have no standing here. So it's the idea sort of of first come, first served. Well, we have the same kind of idea with a rights protecting government. If a rights protecting government already exists and you're either there, you're in that geographic area, or you come to that geographic area, take it either way, um, the rights protecting government was there first. You don't need to establish another, quote, rights protecting government. The, the, you don't need to establish what would become a civil war to governments in the same area vying for the same, uh, you know, control of the same area. So it doesn't make any sense. You, you, you've come to the blessing, in effect, or you, you were born into the blessing, as we in, in the more rights respecting cultures of the West today were. So if you are in a rights protecting or substantially rights protecting system, if you're already living in a, in a, in a country where the government mostly protects rights, uh, there's no reason to try to replace that government. Now, obviously, if a government gets to a certain point in its, in its lack of rights protection or its rights violations, uh, then it is time to rebel against that government, which is precisely what the American founders did. Uh, they, they said to King George, enough, we're not doing this anymore. You have violated our rights beyond where we're willing to uh, work with you toward, toward correcting this system. So we're going to create our own system. So there are, there's a time and a place for that. Uh, but the time and the place for that is not in the existence of a perfectly rights respecting uh, government. So A, we can create a rights protecting government. The knowledge is there. We know what rights are. We know how to ground them in reality. If you, if you are unaware of that, search Ayn Rand's theory of rights and read up on that. So we know what rights are. We know how to justify them on wholly secular grounds, according to the, the factual requirements of human life and flourishing. Uh, we know that there are degrees of rights protection in government, so we can achieve a greater degree and ultimately a full degree if the culture is sufficiently educated and, and desires to have this kind of government. We can even support that government uh, in voluntary ways because if people want a, a government that protects rights, they will pay for it. And think of it this way, people either want a government that protects rights or they don't. If they do, they'll pay for it. If they don't, they won't. Um, but if they do, and if we have that kind of government, then if you are in that geographic area, you, you are living in uh, a blessing. So now I want to uh, touch on a few uh, things that are sort of sticking points uh, for some people on this. And that is um, uh, some uh, uh, libertarians and or anarchists will say, well, I want to be able to do arbitration instead of going through the courts. Well, that's fine. I mean, you can do arbitration in the United States today. There's arbitration all over the place. It happens all the time. The only difference is that in a rights-respecting society under a rights-protecting government, that the government is the final arbiter. So if the arbitration fails to, uh, to, to bring the, the, the disputing sides to a resolution, uh, they're not going to start beating each other up or shooting at each other in the streets. The government comes in and says, okay, what's going on here? And the thing goes to court and you, you uh, have the government as a final arbiter. Another sticking point. So the bottom line there is your, uh, your arbitration uh, desires are not, are not blocked by a rights protecting government. You're, you're welcome to engage in that. Uh, another sticking point for a lot of people is the idea of a subpoena. Well, you know, so all of a sudden you're subpoenaed to court because the court has good reason to believe that you have knowledge about some crime that was committed. Uh, say your, your neighbor uh, is, be, is accused of raping children and they, they have good reason to believe uh, the courts do that, that you have some knowledge of this. And so some anarchists will say, well, I don't want to have to be uh, forced to go to court and, and uh, disclose the information that I might have. Well, that's ridiculous. If, 
if your concern is the protection of individual rights, you, you cannot be party to the uh, violation of individual rights, which you effectively would be if you kept your mouth shut when you knew that your neighbor had been ra raping children. So a subpoena is not actually a violation of your rights. It's a recognition of the fact that in order for rights to be protected in a civilized society, if someone has knowledge or if the court has reason to believe that someone has knowledge of a crime, that that person has to be required to come to court and disclose what he knows about it. Uh, this is not a violation of anyone's rights. This is a recognition of what it means to uphold rights. And the third uh, thing I want to touch on is the issue of uh, mandatory jury uh, duty. Um, and you could take this either way. I've heard some people argue plausibly that you could have professional jurors, uh, just uh, juries the same way that we have professional judges, uh, and that there would be ways to make that uh, still objective. Uh, uh, or take it this way, take it this, on the same grounds that I was talking about a subpoena. Um, if it's true, if, if the arguments play out, uh, if reason wins on the side of we need a jury system because uh, that's the only way to maintain objectivity in the courts, then that's the only way to maintain objectivity in the courts. And uh, so being uh, required to sit on the jury every once in a while is part and parcel of what's necessary in that society to uh, have rights upheld. So think about it this way. If you think you're an anarchist or if you claim to be an anarchist, is the reason that you are because you're concerned with individual rights and you don't want a government to violate individual rights. If that's your reason for holding on to anarchy as a good idea, I think you should rethink it. I think you should check your premises because under a rights protecting government, no one, including the government, will violate your rights. In fact, the whole point is it's illegal for anyone to violate your rights. You don't need to have a, quote, uh, private protection agency that competes with the government because the government isn't doing anything that you need to be protected from. On the contrary, it's protecting you from violations of rights. And you don't have to worry about taxation because in a free society, a genuinely fully free society, there is no mandatory taxation. There is uh, voluntary contributions to the government and you can either pay those contributions or you can not pay them and then suffer the social ostracization that, that comes with that. And for more on that, again, see my article, uh, How Would Government Be Funded in a Free Society? So to wrap it up, um, for any of you who might have thought you were uh, an anarchist because you thought that all governments are necessarily uh, rights violators, uh, either because they impose laws on people or because they uh, mandate taxation or the like, uh, I think if you think uh, more deeply and more broadly about this, you'll realize that that's not true. Uh, a, a fully rights protecting government is a possibility. Uh, it's a possibility today because we have the knowledge we need to establish such a government. We know what rights are and we know what kinds of governmental systems actually can support rights. What we need to do is we need to educate people. This, the, the, the answer to this problem is all about education. If we want to work toward a, rights, a fully rights protecting society, we need more people to understand that it's possible. We need people to understand what rights are, how a government can be funded voluntarily, why, why such a government is possible, uh, why it is possible for a government to exist and not violate rights. In other words, the idea of a government that does one thing only, and that is protect rights. And there are many other elements to this. I'm not going to work all of this into a, a 20 minute discussion. But if you if you thought you were a, an anarchist uh, and any of these ideas today uh, uh, got you thinking that you might not be, I suggest you keep thinking about it because you might not be an anarchist. You might be a radical for capitalism. You might be someone who realizes that we need a fully free society with a fully rights protecting government. And if you realize that you are in this camp, uh, the camp of radical capitalists, we'd love you to join the fray because we need all the help we can get in spreading these ideas. I hope you found these ideas helpful. Uh, if you have any questions for uh, a future episode of Craig Biddle Live, let me know. You can either put them in the comments below here or email me at Craig Biddle, excuse me, cbiddle at theobjectivestandard.com. Till next time, love your life.